Welcome to the online workshop for a new Division C trial event, Hydrogeology Water for the World. My name is Amy Kessner, and I am currently the Science Olympiad Program Manager at the Groundwater Foundation. If, at the end of the workshop, you have any questions, please feel free to email me at akessner at groundwater.org. This event has many sponsors, including the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality, the Nebraska Environmental Trust, J.A. Wollum Foundation, and the Kansas Association for Conservation and Environmental Education. Hydrogeology is the study of groundwater, hydro being water, and geology being the study of the earth. It also happens to be a new Science Olympiad Division C trial event that incorporates groundwater computer modeling. You might be wondering, what exactly is the difference between a trial event and an official event? Well, a trial event is still in the development phase and will not count towards a team's official score at an event. However, feedback from students trialing the event at competitions is extremely important and useful in finalizing the event before it hopefully becomes official. This particular event is designed to build upon another event you may have heard of, Awesome Aquifers. Awesome Aquifers was also developed by the Groundwater Foundation, but is a Division B event. The most current version of the event rules can be found at the Groundwater Foundation's website, www.groundwater.org forward slash so.html. These rules will be updated throughout the trialing process, so make sure to check the website often for the latest updates and changes to the rules. Currently, the event takes place in three parts. In part one, students take a written test on groundwater concepts and vocabulary. In part two, students use and manipulate a groundwater computer model in natural conditions, meaning there's no human impact, in order to determine the flow of groundwater. In part three, students will use the groundwater computer model to determine the effects of human impact on the groundwater system. Students will also select the best course or courses of action to remediate and or lessen human impact. For part one, some possible concepts students will be expected to know include hydrologic properties, specific yield, porosity and permeability, water table variations, aquifer recharge and discharge, transmissivity, aquifer storage, effects of groundwater withdrawals, characteristics of groundwater flow, and contaminants and their impact to groundwater. You can visit our website to learn all about all of these concepts as well as find further links to additional resources. In parts two and three of the event, students will be expected to run a groundwater computer model in order to answer questions. In order to prepare for the event, the student should follow the three steps listed here. Step one, students should know the basics. What is groundwater? How does groundwater move? What information is needed in order to model the movement of groundwater? Once the student knows the basics, they can move on to step two, know your model. All models are useful, but no model is correct. What I mean by this is that all models make assumptions. Thus, students need to know what assumptions the hydrogeology model makes. Furthermore, students need to know what the model is telling them. They need to know what inputs generate what outputs. Once the student knows all of this information, they can move on to step three, running the model. Today I wanted to run through all three steps students can take to prepare for running the groundwater model during the hydrogeology event. So we'll begin with the basics. Groundwater is the water found underground in the cracks and spaces in soil, sand, and rock. It is stored in and moves slowly through geologic formations of soil, sand, and rocks called aquifers. When rain falls and seeps into the soil, it will first travel through an area where most of the pore spaces between the rocks are filled with air. This is known as the unsaturated zone. As the water penetrates deeper, it will eventually enter an area where all of the pore spaces are filled with water, which is groundwater, and this is the saturated zone. The surface or level below which the ground is saturated with water is known as the water table. The water table elevation is a very important piece of information when it comes to determining groundwater flow, so you will hear that term a lot in this talk. 
This diagram shows the movement of groundwater in natural conditions. As one might expect, groundwater naturally moves from areas with higher water table elevations to areas of lower water table elevations. In this diagram, water is recharged to the groundwater system by percolation of water from precipitation, and then it flows to the stream through the groundwater system. One important concept to note is the riparian zone, which is the interface between land and a river or stream. Now we can explore how anthropogenic or human influence affects groundwater flow. As shown in the diagram, water pumped from the groundwater system causes the water table to lower and alters the direction of groundwater movement. The lowering of the water table near the well is known as the cone of depression. Some water that originally flowed to the stream in the natural conditions no longer does and some water may be drawn in from the stream into the groundwater system thereby reducing the amount of stream flow. Furthermore, contaminants introduced at the land surface may infiltrate to the water table and flow towards a point of discharge, such as the well or the stream. Now that you know the basic premise for how groundwater flows, the next step is to know the information needed in order to model the groundwater flow. At the most basic level, there are three pieces of information needed in order to model the groundwater flow. They are flow direction, gradient, and horizontal velocity. But how do we determine these pieces of information? We can't just look down and see groundwater and its flow direction as we would a river or stream. Since we can't see groundwater, we use wells to determine the flow direction, gradient, and horizontal velocity. To do this, we need information from at least three wells. We need to know the water table elevation at each well, the distance between each well, as well as the hydraulic conductivity and porosity of the soil at each well. Those last two terms may be unfamiliar to you, so I will go over them in more detail. Hydraulic conductivity describes the ease with which water can move through pore spaces or fractures. It's related to the permeability of a rock or sediment. It also depends on gradient, permeability, and level of saturation. High permeability means that pore spaces are connected to one another, allowing water to flow freely. A good example of this is gravel. Low permeability means that pore spaces are isolated and water becomes trapped. And a good example of this is clay. On the left, you can see a table of some different soil types and their conductivities. Porosity is the amount of empty space within a given material. It is measured as a percentage. For soil and rock, this empty space exists between grains of minerals as shown in the diagram. Now that you know the basics, you're ready to move on to step two, know your model. In order to learn about the hydrogeology groundwater model, we are going to do an activity. This activity will involve using the paper version of the hydro model, which you can download at the Groundwater Foundation's website. You will also need colored pencils, a ruler, and if you like, a calculator. In order to do the activity, you will also need to download the hydrogeology well data log. The well data log lists the well depth, ground elevation, groundwater static elevation, groundwater pumping elevation, and lithology information for all 10 wells. It is important to note that all elevations are given in units of feet. Now, let's look at just well one. Well one has a depth of 140 feet below the surface. The elevation of the surface is 1,560 feet. The groundwater static elevation, or water table elevation when the well is not pumping water, is 1,435 feet. When the well is pumping water, the water table lowers to 1,425 feet, which is the groundwater pumping elevation. The next section on the log lists the depth below the surface all the way to bottom of the well, which is 140 feet. It describes the lithology or soil type for every layer below the surface and gives the corresponding conductivity and porosity. So, for example, at 60 feet below the surface, the soil is silty sand, the conductivity is 6.7 feet per day, and the porosity is 44%. We are first going to go through the activity in static conditions. 
meaning there's no human impact. The first step to calculating the groundwater flow in static conditions is to label the static elevation of each well. You can find the static elevation listed in the well data log. Once you have labeled all of your wells, you can begin drawing your contour lines for your water table elevations. As you can see, I have already drawn the water table elevation contour line for 1,435 feet. When drawing your contours, make sure that none of your contour lines cross each other as this is not physically possible. You can continue to draw contour lines at intervals of 5 feet until you complete the scenario. You should have contour lines from 1,420 feet to 1,450 feet. You cannot draw contours for 1,415 feet or 1,455 feet because you do not have enough information to do so. From these contour lines, we now know the general flow of groundwater. Groundwater always wants to move from the higher water table elevation to lower water table elevation. So we can see that in the northern part of our scenario, the groundwater is generally moving towards the south. And then in the southern part of our scenario, the groundwater begins to curve off to the east. Now, to determine the exact groundwater flow, we need to choose three wells. For this activity, we are going to choose wells 1, 5, and 7. They are highlighted in red. We can now follow the directions on the paper version of the model in order to determine the flow direction. First, we need to draw a black line from the well with the highest water table elevation, which is well 1, with an elevation of 1,435 feet, to the well with the lowest water table elevation, which is well 5, with an elevation of 1,427 feet. Then, we can use the given equation to find the point P between the highest and lowest wells equal to the water table elevation of the middle well. The water table elevation of the highest well minus the water table elevation of the middle well is equal to 2. The water table elevation of the highest well minus the water table elevation of the lowest well is equal to 8. 2 divided by 8 is 0 0.25. Next, we need to use the ruler to measure the distance between the highest well and the lowest well. Measuring from the center of the well, this distance is equal to approximately 1.5 inches. To convert inches to miles, we can use the map scale. One inch is equal to 2.5 miles. Thus, 1.5 inches is equal to 3.75 miles. Multiplying 3.75 miles by 0 0.25 gives us the distance from the highest well to point P, which is 0 0.9375 miles. In the third part of calculating flow direction, we want to draw the contour line that is equal to the water table elevation of the middle well, or 1,433 feet. To do this, we first mark the point between the highest and lowest wells equal to the water table elevation of the middle well, which is point P. We know the distance from the highest well to point P is 0 0.9375 miles. Using the scale once again, we can calculate the distance in inches to be 0 0.375 inches. Then, we can draw a green line from point P to the middle well, which is well 7. This is a 1,433 feet contour line. We now have all of the necessary information to determine the flow direction. Groundwater flows from areas of higher water table elevation to areas of lower water table elevation. Thus, the flow of groundwater will be perpendicular to the contour line, which is a line of equal water table elevation. In this scenario, the groundwater is flowing from the northwest to the southeast. You can represent groundwater flow by drawing in blue arrows that are perpendicular to your green contour line. Next, we can move on to part two, which is calculating gradient. In order to calculate the gradient, you must first find the distance, which we're calling D, from the highest well to the contour line. You can draw in this line in red. Remember, this line should make a 90 degree angle with the contour line because we want the shortest possible distance. Next, you can measure the distance of D in feet. 
Remember, one mile equals 5,280 feet. So if we measure this distance, we have D equal to approximately 0 0.3125 inches, which we can convert to miles by multiplying it by 2.5 miles per inch, which is 0 0.78125 miles, which is equal to 4,125 feet. Finally, we can calculate the gradient by filling in the given equation. We know the water table elevation of the highest well, well 1, is 1,435 feet, and the water table elevation of the middle well, well 7, is 1,433 feet. Taking the difference between the water table elevation of well 1 and well 7, and dividing it by our distance d, gives us our gradient, which is 0 0.00048. Notice that gradient is a unitless quantity, which we label as feet for feet, in order to clarify what units should be used when calculating the equation. Also note that the gradient is very, very small. So small, in fact, that it could not be seen with the naked eye. We have now completed parts one and two of the activity and can move on to part three, horizontal velocity. Three variables are needed to calculate the horizontal velocity of groundwater. They are gradient, hydraulic conductivity, and porosity. You have already calculated the gradient, which is denoted as the variable I. We can use the hydrogeology well data log to look up the hydraulic conductivity and porosity. To do this, we want to look up the information for our well with the highest water table elevation, as that is the well the groundwater will be flowing from. In our case, this is well one. Then, we want to determine how far below the surface the water table lies. For well one, in static conditions, the water table elevation is at 1,435 feet, which is 125 feet below the ground elevation, which is 1,560 feet. Thus, we know that all layers of soil at or below 125 feet below the surface are in the saturated zone containing groundwater. We only know of one layer, which is sandstone, which has a conductivity of 26.8 feet per day and a porosity of 0.33. It is important to note that our model assumes that groundwater always flows through the layer of highest conductivity. For example, if our water table elevation was located 60 feet below the surface, we would have a layer of saturated silty sand as well as a layer of saturated sandstone below it. While the water table would be located in the silty sand, we would assume the groundwater would be flowing from the sandstone because sandstone has a higher conductivity than sand. In reality, groundwater would flow from both, but our model only assumes it flows from one layer. Now that we know that sandstone is the saturated material with the highest conductivity, we can plug in the needed information into Darcy's equation to calculate horizontal velocity. In Darcy's equation, hydraulic conductivity is K, gradient is I, and porosity is N. Using the equation, we calculate a velocity of 0.039 feet per day. As you can now see, groundwater does not move very fast. Now that you have successfully calculated groundwater flow in natural conditions, we will move on to the more challenging anthropogenic or non-static conditions. In non-static conditions, we will label some wells as pumping water and thus introduce human impact. Starting with a new worksheet, we can once again follow the same steps as we did in static conditions. However, in this scenario, wells 6, 7, and 8 will be pumping water, and thus they will have a new water table elevation, which is equal to that of the groundwater pumping elevation listed in the hydrogeology well data log. I have marked wells that are pumping water with a blue raindrop. Once again, you can draw in your water table elevation contour lines every five feet. This time, you should have contour lines from 1,415 feet all the way to 1,450 feet. Now that three wells are pumping water, the general direction of the groundwater flow has been altered. In the northern part of our scenario, we still have groundwater flowing from the north, but in the southern portion of our scenario, the groundwater is now flowing toward the northeast. Once again, 
we will calculate the groundwater flow using wells 1, 5, and 7, marked in red, in order to determine how human impact affects the groundwater flow. Beginning with part 1, our well with highest water table elevation is still well 1, but our well with lowest water table elevation has changed and is now well 7 with an elevation of 1,413 feet. Once again, draw a black line from the well with the highest water table elevation to the well with the lowest water table elevation. Next, we can use the given equation to determine the distance from the highest well, well 1, to point P. This distance is about 1.46 miles. Mark point P on your map, remembering to use the map scale and ruler to convert distances between inches and miles. Once you have marked point P, you can once again draw a green contour line from point P to the middle well. This contour line is now equal to a water table elevation of 1,427 feet. Draw in your blue groundwater flow arrows, remembering that groundwater always flows perpendicular to the contour lines and from highest to lowest water table elevation. We can now see that by pumping water in wells 6, 7, and 8, we have changed the direction of the groundwater flow from southeast to south-southwest. To calculate gradient, draw in your red line from your highest well to your 1,427 feet green contour line. This line should make a 90 degree angle with the contour line. Using your ruler, measure the distance of your red line and convert the distance to feet. You should get a distance of about 6,600 feet. Then, we can use the equation in part two to calculate the gradient which is about 0.0012. This gradient, while still very small and invisible to the naked eye, is quite a bit larger than the gradient in natural conditions. This implies that our velocity will probably be greater, but we need to use Darcy's equation in part three, including soil properties to know for sure. Once again, we use well one, which is our well with the highest water table elevation, to determine the hydraulic conductivity and porosity of the soil that the groundwater is flowing through. Since well one is still not pumping water, the water table is still 125 feet below the surface, and our hydraulic conductivity and porosity remain the same as they were under natural conditions. Using Darcy's equation, we calculate a horizontal velocity of 0.097 feet per day. While the groundwater is still moving very slowly, it is moving almost 2.5 times faster than it was in natural conditions. This means that if a pollutant was introduced to this portion of the groundwater system, it would travel 2.5 times faster than it would under natural conditions, which is a very big deal when remediation comes into play. You have now successfully calculated groundwater flow in both static and non-static conditions. As I touched on earlier but wanted to reiterate, in this model we assume that water only flows through the layer of highest conductivity. Thus, you should always assume that the saturated layer of highest conductivity is where the water is flowing from and use the corresponding conductivity and porosity in your calculations. You now know how the model works. You know what inputs it requires as well as what outputs it gives you. So what are the assumptions? We have discussed a few already, but we lay them out here. First, the model assumes that the aquifer which contains the groundwater is simple and uniform. Second, the model assumes that the flow is under a steady state. And finally, the model assumes that the chosen aquifer properties, such as hydraulic conductivity and porosity, are correct. Now that we have completed step one, know the basics, and step two, know your model, we can move on to step three, run the model. Currently, the Groundwater Foundation is working with Beehive Industries, a software company located in Lincoln, Nebraska, to develop the hydrogeology groundwater flow model. The model is being written in HTML5, meaning it will be available on any platform that has internet, such as computers and iPads, and it is expected to be ready for running in late December or early January. For now, we have screenshots of what the model will look like to give you a feel for the model. 
As you will see, the model is very similar to the paper version of the model we just completed as an activity. You will begin with a scenario which contains any number of wells. For each well, you are given the ground elevation, G, groundwater static elevation, S, and groundwater pumping elevation, P. You are also given the option of turning the pumping of each well on or off in order to introduce human impact. As with the paper version of the model, the Hydrogeology Computer Groundwater Flow Model requires you to select three wells. Once you have selected three wells, the model will give you the distances you need to know. You can then fill in the necessary information in order to calculate the groundwater flow direction. A neat feature about this model is that there will be a practice version and a testing version. In the practice version, which is shown here, students will have the option to either check their answer or show the solution, allowing them to alter their answers if they typed in something wrong. When they check their answer, the boxes will appear green if they are correct and red if they are incorrect. If they click show solution, the answers will be given to them. In the testing version, these buttons will not be an option. On another note, when calculating the groundwater flow direction, the model will draw in the point P, which is labeled as point AB in the model, as well as draw in the contour line. The student can then use their knowledge of groundwater flow to determine the direction of the groundwater flow. In this slide, you can see an example of the show solution button. The incorrect answers are in red, while the correct answers are listed in green. Once the student has entered the direction they think the groundwater will flow, the model will draw in a blue arrow depicting the direction of the flow. In this way, the student can see if they were correct and get a visual representation of the flow. Another cool feature of the practice version of the model is what we are calling the reality check. The reality check will not be available during testing situations. As you already know, the hydrogeology model makes several assumptions. Thus, the reality check will be a resource for students to learn about model assumptions and what would happen in reality. This will not only help them learn about groundwater and modeling, but will also help them interpret their results when they run the model. Right now, the reality check shown is written in Latin, but don't worry, we'll make sure to have that changed by the time, is mo by the, time the model is ready to run. The hydrogeology computer model will proceed through all three parts of calculating groundwater flow just like the paper version. First, flow direction, then gradient, and finally, horizontal velocity. When calculating horizontal velocity, the information boxes will expand to show the students the same information as you saw earlier in the hydrogeology well data log, including the depth, lithology, conductivity, and porosity. They can then use this information to select the correct conductivity and porosity for calculating Darcy's equation to determine the horizontal velocity of groundwater. Once the students have completed every part of the model, a box will pop up prompting them to print or return to the drop-down menu to continue practicing using another scenario. The Groundwater Foundation has received a lot of feedback from Science Olympiad coaches, directors, and volunteers that printing resources will most likely not be available at most tournaments. Thus, the Groundwater Foundation is currently working with Beehive Industries to come up with alternative ways for students to submit their answers, such as possibly by email. Now that you have learned all about groundwater modeling, we can jump back to the Science Olympiad event rules. To reiterate, in Part 1, students take a written test on groundwater concepts. In Part 2, students will use the groundwater model to calculate groundwater flow using three wells. They will then answer questions about the given scenario. All of this will lead into part three, which introduces human impact. In part three of the event, students will be given a set of human impact circumstances. These circumstances may include a list of wells that are pumping water, as well as a contaminant and its source. Students will then use the model to answer questions about the effects of human impact. These questions will focus on which wells are at risk of becoming contaminated by the pollutant, as well as how long it will be until they become contaminated. Finally, students will evaluate possible courses of action to remediate and or lessen the effects of human impact on the scenario. In scoring for the event, 
Parts 1 and 2 are both worth 25% of the score, while Part 3 is worth 50%. This means students will have to use their time wisely in order to receive the most points. There are two tiebreakers. First, the highest score on Part 3, and second, the highest score on pre-selected questions from Parts 1 and 2. Additional resources can be found at the Groundwater Foundation's Science Olympiad website, www.groundwater.org forward slash so.html. These resources include the event rules, event guides, links to groundwater resources, the paper version of hydrogeology that we completed in today's workshop, links to USGS groundwater models, and much more. These resources will continually be updated throughout the trialing process so make sure to check the website often for the most up-to-date information. Thank you for listening to the Hydrogeology Water for the World workshop. We hope you had a lot of fun and we look forward to your feedback. If you have any questions or comments, please email me, Amy Kessner, at akessner at groundwater.org. Thanks again.